two months into 2024 and 8,100 people have already been laid off in gaming. That's 8,100 in addition to the 10,000 from last year. What's going on? The industry is worth $200 billion a year. Why are they firing so many? Are costs so high that companies are struggling and have to fire people to survive? Unity fired 1,800 people, but in looking at their numbers, they've lost $847 million in the past 12 months. They've also lost hundreds of millions every year over the past few years. So while it's tough to stomach, it's totally understandable why Unity did it. But what about Playtica? They made over half a billion last year, but recently fired 400. And Riot? 530 fired. But Tencent, their parent company, made 23.5 billion last year. The same story with Amazon. After making close to 37 billion, they fired 500 at Twitch. What about Microsoft? They just fired 1,900 people. How are they doing? 94 billion in profits. Hey yo, what the fuck? Hi, welcome back to a PM Explains. My name is Austin Yuan. I've been working in games for the past 15 years, but right now is the wildest time that I've ever seen. It seems that layoffs are happening every other day. I started this channel in order to explain things from a product manager's perspective taking a look at a wide variety of perspectives and data, trying to help people understand the bigger picture. With that said, let me say that these layoffs are only a signal of things to come. If you take nothing else from the rest of this video, know this one thing. A company has zero obligation to look after you or any of its employees. Sure, they have to pay employees for their services, but if these services are no longer needed or can be obtained somewhere cheaper, they're gone. There's nothing malicious or immoral about these actions. Companies exist to make money for themselves and their investors. It's important for you to realize that this is the fundamental relationship between you and your employer. And as a person that's been on the receiving and giving end of job cuts, I can tell you that money is the only deciding factor on who's fired and who isn't. Here's how the meeting typically goes. The CEO will tell upper management that they need budget cuts and that a layoff is needed. So we're given a target, whether a percentage or a specific number of employees, it doesn't really matter. And we need to reduce headcount. Headcount. That's how we're referred. Not employees or people. We're headcount. We're going to be getting rid of these people here. Uh, first, Mr. Samir Naga... 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 Not going to work here anymore anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and management doesn't even bother with names. Headcount is just a line item on Excel that needs to be reduced. And maybe, just maybe, if you cut more than expected, you can get a bonus. But why is gaming cutting so many jobs right now? One reason is that during the pandemic, gaming revenues soared since people were at home. Companies hired a lot of employees to catch this wave, but as the money slowed, layoffs are the correction to their overhiring. There's also far less investment in gaming startups. Rising interest rates meant that investors no longer need to take risky bets. They can store money in a bank and get 5%. And speaking of bets, more importantly, bad bets, what about the studios that hired for the metaverse or NFTs? Who's even talking about these games anymore? And finally, there's the big one, AI. Companies are scrambling to incorporate it or at the very least keep investors happy by saying they are. How companies will add AI into their products is uncertain. But what is certain is that the future of game production won't need as many people. But before we get into this conversation, let me say that I'm not against progress. I'm simply suggesting that we have a conversation about how we use AI instead of watching AI be used on us. We're in entertainment. I don't think AI can ever do that. But you can't deny that they've made significant progress. Take a step back and look at the progress Midjourney has made in the past year. This was made within seconds, simply by typing a prompt. ChatGPT passed the bar in 2023, but since then, it's also passed the SAT, GRE, and medical licensing exams by a comfortable range. Using this tech means that a lot of basic job functions are going to be replaced by AI, and it doesn't take Nostradamus to see that your company is salivating at this opportunity to reduce headcount and increase margins, because companies are going to fire as many people as they can get away with, and the majority of firings are going to come from products that are already completed. Because once something is up and running, why do you need to keep the people that built it? So with all this talk about AI and layoffs, shall we play a game? 
let's transform ourselves into gaming executives. Revenue isn't what it was, and investors are breathing down our necks to incorporate AI. There's no doubt that AI will create a lot of new jobs in the future, but the exact type of jobs and when we'll need them is completely uncertain. So as executives, we need to prepare for the future by aggressively moving to reduce headcount and lowering OPEX now. And how do we do this while keeping productivity and revenue the same? How do we achieve this? Simple. We just ask employees to do more. I'm going to need you to go ahead and come in tomorrow. So if you could be here around 9, that would be great. Okay? Oh, oh, and I almost forgot. Uh, I'm also going to need you to go ahead and come in on Sunday, too. Okay? We uh, lost some people this week, and uh, we need to sort of play catch up. Thanks. And of course they'll do it. They're frightened to death that they'll be next on the chopping block. Because this has been a very difficult time for our work family. And just in case we go too far and cut too many, we can always rehire. Right, Elon? But we can't just randomly cut jobs. We have a business to run. So here are the rules. Let's cut jobs if outsourcing is available or if AI can produce a similar result. So creative work is going to be a little bit more difficult, but production and jobs meant to search for right answers? Oh, those can be cut very easily. So now that you have the rules, let's reduce some headcount. I think we could all agree that this will be the most obvious. There's a lot of headcount in our production. AI art is getting better every day. Using a single prompt, these are the same results a year apart. Look at OpenAI's Sora. This was generated with a single prompt. Any artist focused solely on production can easily be cut. Once a machine can learn, be consistent with art style, and produce clips longer than a minute, mass production of art using AI is just a matter of time. Don't believe me? Here's the co-founder of DreamWorks. Well, the good old days when, you know, I, I made an animated movie. It took 500 artists five <clears throat> years to make a world-class animated movie. I, I think it won't take 10% of right. that. Literally, I don't think it will take 10% of that uh, three years out from now. So the artists that we'll keep are the ones that can create art styles, focus on scheduling, work across departments, and write prompts. Everyone else? Gone. Outside of headcount, marketing is our largest area of spend. Testing different creatives to see which has a better return on ad investment is extremely straightforward. This role is completely results-driven and ripe for automation. Sure, someone still needs to manage the campaigns, but we could ask this person to generate all the creatives, set up all the campaigns, and optimize for 4 to 6 games instead of 1 to 2. Google's already doing it, so we just have to follow their lead. I don't think AI is going to create the next Citizen Kane or Harry Potter, but at the bare minimum, it'll get 50% of the way there. That's why Hollywood writers were so adamant about not allowing AI to learn how to write scripts, but we don't have to worry about that. Because in games, our writers don't have those protections, so we can do whatever we want. AI won't eliminate writers just yet, but for mobile, dialogue is pretty terrible and inconsequential. And not to knock narrative-based games like episodes or chapters, generative AI can easily turn writers into editors, working on scripts for 4-6 to six games instead of 1-2. to two. We can easily pump out more content, faster, and for less. We collect a giant pool of data, but the trouble is finding actionable items from that data. Analysts find the right answers to PM's questions. If a role produces right answers, AI can eliminate that position. Once a language model is hooked up to the data, we can ask it to provide answers in a fraction of the time an analyst would. In the beginning, we may only be able to ask simple questions like, what are whales buying the most? But eventually, it should be able to tackle more challenging questions. And as it improves, there's no reason why analysts won't be completely eliminated. Sure, we'll need somebody to set it up, but once that's done, we can fire them. There are many parts of a PM's job that are very difficult to automate, like holding a game's vision, prioritization, or simply asking the right questions to drive revenue. I'm not sure whether AI can ask those questions, but there are plenty of basic tasks where AI can help, such as analysis. Every team should analyze their competitors' games. This is an important part of being a PM, but analysis is extremely time-consuming, so it's generally reserved for junior PMs so that they can learn about the business. 
But if AI can do it, why do we need to hire juniors? Sure, it'll be harder for younger people to break into the industry, but that's their problem, not ours. This is a tough one. I'm nowhere near qualified to talk about engineering, so I asked some engineer friends about how good ChatGPT is at code. Answers range from being junior level to wildly inept, but most would agree that it's a good starting point, but nowhere near the finished article. For now, let's just say that it's not good enough to displace anyone just yet, but at the very least, no more hiring junior engineers. This is another tough one, because designers have the hardest job to quantify. They make a game fun, but there's no correct path to deliver that, so it's going to be hard to eliminate these people outright. Some functions, like systems or game economy design, can be made easier. There are already tools like machinations that help. But hopefully, language models will allow PMs to do this via prompt in the future, reducing the needs for a systems designer. If so, it's a game changer, but we're not there just yet. But we can add more pressure to our designers, because they see all their colleagues in art and data get eliminated, we can easily scare them and say if they don't deliver on fun faster, we'll replace them with someone who will. What else can we be forgetting? Us? Replaced? No way. Who's going to hold the whip? The C-suite, upper management, will be largely untouched. Someone's got to do the bidding of the investors. Sure, some of us may change here and there, but replaced? No chance. And there you have it. In just a few minutes, we've easily cut a company's headcount by half. Were you affected? If not, congratulations. But what about the next round? Or the one after that? Because generative AI and outsourcing can come for any job, putting us all in a race to the bottom. Why? Profits. Companies are designed to streamline profits. They'll work you to death and fire you in a heartbeat for more. We work 60 to 80 hours a week without any additional pay. Take on the workload of people laid off, forego holidays, and work through illness. And we're constantly stressed over the possibility of getting fired. We've accepted all of this as a consequence of working in gaming. But it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to live like this. In 2023, over half a million workers across the U.S. went on strike. And guess what? They won. Hey, Robin, good morning to you. The Hollywood writer's strike is officially over. The nearly 150-day strike ending one minute after midnight. And the union securing some major wins here. Details of this deal have been sparse until now, but here's what we know so far. This three-year deal outlines a 12.5% pay increase, starting with a 5% bump when the contract is ratified. One of the sticking points involved royalties, and the writers secured a 76% increase for their foreign streaming residuals, and they will also receive receive a viewership-based streaming bonus. And another big win for these members, studios and streamers will have to hire a minimum number of writers on projects. And the final issue, arguably the most important, revolved around artificial intelligence. The two sides established a set of guidelines regarding the use of AI. What about actors? The AMPTP says that this deal represents a new paradigm, including the largest increase in minimum wages in 40 years a new residual compensation structure for streaming programs, and extensive consent and compensation protections in the use of artificial intelligence. And employees at the UPS got a new deal on the mere threat of a strike. A staggering 97% of unionized UPS workers voted Friday to authorize a strike. Workers' demands include better pay and driver safety improvement. And how lucrative was this deal? The tentative deal includes significant pay raises for all 340,000 of its workers. It would also require air conditioning in all new vehicles starting next year and the retrofitting of older vehicles for increased heat safety. Additionally, it would end UPS's two-tier wage system and create thousands of new full-time jobs within the company. And what was the common thread between all of these deals? They were all part of a union. One of the biggest reasons why gaming isn't unionized already is because gaming was born during a period of decreasing union membership and influence. Over the past few decades, long-term gaslighting efforts and government legislation have reduced union power and increased the difficulty to form new unions. A full explanation of how and why this was done would take an entire Netflix series to cover. And as a former historian, I would love to talk about it one day, but that won't be today, because today, Let's just talk about the state of working in games. As a whole, we produce more than ever. 
but has her pay kept up? Companies are doing extremely well. That's very clear. This was Microsoft two years ago. Keep your eye on Microsoft uh, closing with a $2 trillion market cap for the first time joining Apple in that club. And this is them a few weeks back. But the other big story today, as I mentioned at the outset, Microsoft, $3 trillion in market cap. 40365 was the number to beat. Let's take a look at the stock there because it's above it now. Microsoft has increased their worth by a trillion dollars in two years. Do you understand a trillion dollars? Most people think that it's just six extra zeros added to the end of a million. But let me put this into context for you. If you had a million seconds of time, you'd have 11 and a half days. But if you had a trillion seconds of time, that's 31,709 years. That's how much Microsoft has grown in the last two years. They're the largest gaming company in the world. Do you think they grew to those heights without looking after their best interests? But the question is, who's looking after ours? I mean, shouldn't we get a fair share of the profits we help create? And that's what we'll talk about today. You ready? Great. Throws the ball behind Thompson, throws it away. Durant running to the rim. Oh! Oh, there are no words for how nasty. After the drive, gets inside, leans in. Knocked away and stolen by Holiday. Phoenix has to foul. And a pinnacle ball throws it down. And a foul. Giannis on the alley-oop. What a turnaround. Hit by Dom. Punched ahead for Griffin. He'll drive. He'll finish. He'll slam dunk. He's topped himself again somehow. Now, some of you may be wondering why basketball has anything to do with us in gaming. Here it is. Have you ever wondered why NBA salaries continue to climb year after year while yours doesn't? Team owners aren't better or more generous. They only pay these high salaries because they're required to. And why are they required? Because of the NBA's players union. This union collectively bargained with the owners to share in the profits of the league. So the TV deal, ticket sales, concessions, apparel, merchandising, all of that revenue is lumped together and after expenses are subtracted, a percentage of the total profit is reserved for player compensation, covering everything from salaries, healthcare, pensions, disability, and even an education reimbursement. So how much of the profit do players receive? 51%. Marinate on this number for a second. 51% of all the profits made by the NBA go to the players. So those 40 and $50 million a year contracts are only possible because owners are required to share the profits. And do you know why the owners agree to this? Because they know that without the players, there is no product. Would you pay $500 a ticket to see the billionaire owner of the Mavs hoop? Fuck no. So if the owners want their billions every year, they know that they have to keep these employees happy by sharing profits. Because without the players, the owners have absolutely nothing. And sure, some may say that sports are a niche form of entertainment, and I agree, but what about Hollywood? Our industries are remarkably similar, so when both writers and actors went on strike last year, we should have paid close attention. Because while big stars grab headlines and get paid very well, the great majority of people working in Hollywood don't. So what were all these strikes about? Almost half, 49% of all writers, were only paid the minimum rate allowed by contract. And here's something absolutely shocking. Only 12.7% of the 160,000 actors in SAG-AFTRA made enough to qualify for healthcare benefits. Do you know what the minimum acting income is needed to qualify? 26,470 a year. 87% of all actors don't even make that much to qualify for healthcare. In the past, shows had 20 plus episode seasons. Writers would write scripts prior to shooting and stay on during filming, helping actors understand the material or adjust scripts if something wasn't working. But as streaming became the dominant model and new shows were favored over more episodes, studios increased production by implementing their own version of crunch. Fewer writers were hired to finish in weeks what used to take months. Plus, writers weren't kept during filming. This effectively turned writing, a once stable job, into gig work. Try to imagine for a moment you were one of the six original writers on the hit show Suits. And every time someone watched the show, you received payment for your work, a residual. 
Your show is on Netflix and Peacock and generates over 3 billion viewing minutes every week. You're paid quarterly, so every three months, what do you think you'll earn in residuals? Did you imagine less than $3,000? Not each. Total. Six writers split $3,000 while the studio sold the streaming rights for way more. Executives got paid millions, but the writers and actors who actually made the shows? Crumbs. And finally, both writers and actors want better defined rules regarding the use of AI. Writers didn't want AI to write scripts or learn how to write scripts using their work without compensation. And actors, they didn't want their likenesses to generate new performances without compensation and consent. So just to recap, higher pay, better working conditions, rules regarding AI, and a fair share of the profits. Sound familiar? And for those of you that say we aren't on the same level as the NBA or Hollywood, you're absolutely right. We aren't on the same level. They are nowhere near our league. Hollywood and sports wish they could make as much money as games. Despite the glitz and the glamour of Hollywood, athletes, or singers, our industry, video games, made by us goofy-ass fools, we make more than movies, music, and the big four sports leagues combined. But do you know the difference between us and them? Actors, writers, athletes, they know their worth. We don't. They have unions protecting their interests, demanding better pay, working conditions, and making sure that they get their share of the profits they created. Because they understand that without them, there are no movies, TV shows, or things to watch. Meanwhile, we act like Oliver fucking Twist every performance review. Lisa, I want some more. What? Lisa, I want some more. And I get it. It's easy to be caught up in our day-to-day -day lives and not see the forest for the trees. Because from the outside looking in, we're doing great. We're living the dream. We're working in games. We're given free lunches, work in fancy offices, and for the most part, our salaries, they're pretty good. But what the outsiders don't see, and I don't know if we realize it sometimes, is that we're always working checking emails or slack in the middle of the night, weekends, holidays, when we factor in those hours and the stress that it puts on us, our families, and relationships, are we still making good money? And even if we still are, do we even have the time to enjoy it? And let's not forget that all of us live knowing that what we currently have is tenuous at best, because in gaming, we could be fired at any time, for whatever reason. Don't you find it curious that we work in an industry that makes $200 billion a year, yet none of us feel any job security at all? Hell, even if you work on a hit game and bring in millions every month, it doesn't mean anything. Back when I was working on Racing Rivals, our team brought in $12 million above forecast at the end of the year. And at the beginning of the year, they told us that we'd get bonuses if we did. So after our team worked 80 hours a week for a year straight, what did we get for it? Absolutely nothing! Okay. Okay, that's not entirely true. They did get us something. They got us this $50 cake. So of this $12 million in extra revenue, the company generously shared 0.000004% of that money to the people that made it. See, now that's some bullshit. And this is the norm rather than the exception. Forget about companies doing right by their employees. That ship has sailed long ago and they'll just keep taking advantage of us as long as we let them. This is what I mean by us not understanding our worth. Because once we do, they know they're in trouble. And if you want a perfect example of someone who understands their worth and has executives absolutely shook, look no further than Taylor Swift. Last year, Taylor Swift proved to everyone that these studios need her far more than she needs them. As most of you know, Taylor made a movie last year, but did you know she did it without any studio help? In fact, studios didn't even know about her movie until she announced it. Taylor went directly to the theaters and said, hey, y'all want to show my movie? To which they said, yes please. This movie became the most successful movie concert of all time, grossing over 261 million at the box office. And as a producer on the film, 
Taylor's expected to take home 57% of ticket sales, just a little under $150 million. And after its theatrical run, she went to Disney and sold the streaming rights for $75 million more. By ditching the studios, Taylor did what executives feared the most. She made studios irrelevant. What would you say you do here? And this didn't go unnoticed, including one, Christopher Nolan. Well, and, and Taylor Swift is about to show the studios because that's not her concert film is not being distributed by the studios. It's being distributed by the theater owner, AMC. Wow. And it's going to make an enormous amount of money. And this is the thing. This, this is a format, this is a way of seeing things and sharing stories or sharing experiences that's incredibly valuable. And if they don't want it, somebody else will. So that's, that's just the truth of it. And within a few weeks after Taylor's movie announcement, guess what magically happened? We begin with breaking news now at 6 with major developments from Hollywood as leaders of the WGA announce an end to their strike. A few moments later. Breaking news. sag after appears to have ended the longest actor strike in Hollywood history. According to Variety and the LA Times, there is a tentative agreement. The strike officially ends at midnight. Now, I'm not suggesting that Taylor Swift single-handedly ended both strikes, but I am willing to say that her movie scared executives enough to end the strikes a lot sooner than they wanted. Because an unnamed studio executive told Deadline that the studio's goal was to prolong the strikes in order to allow things to drag on until union members started to lose their apartments and lose their houses. The absolute last thing these executives wanted were writers and actors following Taylor's lead and reimagining a world without the studios, so they ended the strikes and gave them what they wanted. And some people may say that, yeah, Taylor Swift can do this. We don't have any rock stars on that level or that kind of influence. Are you sure about that? What about Zelda, Link, Laura Croft, Ryu, Pikachu, or Mario? Oh, we have plenty of rock stars. In fact, let's take a look at Rockstar, the good folks that made GTA 5. Let's say, for example, hypothetically of course, that everyone at Rockstar North got absolutely pissed at the company and demanded a $500,000 bonus each, or they'd all walk. Now, it's estimated that a thousand people worked on GTA 5, so a thousand people at half a million dollars each, that's half a billion dollars. Will the company pay? No way will take two pay, right? Here's why they might. This isn't some random team. These people made GTA 5, a game that sold over 190 million units. Let's just say that the game averaged $50 a unit. With that single game, this team generated 9.5 billion in revenue alone. Now, think about GTA 6. If this team leaves, Take-Two won't have a game. Even if the game is 90% complete, getting it to the finish line is the hardest part. You can't easily replace a thousand skilled people with years of knowledge and experience overnight. If they don't pay and the employees walk, Wall Street's gonna find out. And what do you think will happen to their stock when they do? And that's not even the worst case scenario. Let's say a company with a lot of cash, say Microsoft, got wind of this. Half a billion dollars ain't shit to them. If Microsoft could convince the team to go work for them, they could easily double what the team is asking. Acquiring the entire GTA team for a billion dollars would be an incredible value in this market. It's a deal. It's a steal. It's sale of the fucking century. If this happens, what do you think will happen to take two stock? Wall Street is incredibly reactionary. A little over a year ago, this fake Eli Lilly tweet sank their stock value 4.37% overnight. But what's 4.3% of this company? $15 billion. So let's just say that the GTA team posted Twitter that they're all leaving Take-Two and going to Microsoft. If Wall Street acts the same as it did with Eli Lilly and Take-Two loses 4% of its market cap, that's a billion dollar loss overnight. But it'll likely be much worse than that because the future of GTA 6 will be uncertain and Wall Street hates uncertainty with its money. So paying that half a billion dollars to its employees doesn't sound too crazy now, does it? Because without the people making the games, a company by itself produces absolutely nothing. So why might this hypothetical example work? For a few reasons. One, this team has extraordinary leverage. Not a lot of us are in the position to say that we've made a $9.5 billion game, 
So if you want to make demands, do it from a position of advantage. But more importantly, this team stood together. If only one of them asked for 500,000, management would have laughed in their face and told them to go kick rocks. But by standing together, well, that's an entirely different story. Last year, over half a million people in the US stood together and went on strike, asking for higher pay, better working conditions, and a fair share. Writers, actors, teachers, nurses, hospitality, and auto workers all fought and won. In addition to higher pay, UPS workers fought for basic heat safety like air conditioning and vans. They won. LA school teachers fought for lower class sizes and higher pay. They won. Healthcare workers at Kaiser Permanente fought for increased staffing and pay raises over the next four years. They won. The United Auto Workers fought and won the return of benefits they gave up in 2008. These workers gave up benefits in order to save the auto industry from collapse during the financial crisis, a crisis of their making. And what did they give up to Ford? The cuts start with perks but include brass tax earnings. If approved, rank and file would get no cost of living adjustments, no Christmas bonuses, no Easter holiday for the next three years, and no performance bonuses. But it goes beyond that. Ford would no longer make up the difference between a laid-off worker's full pay and what they get from unemployment. Break times would be reduced on an eight-hour shift from 50 to 40 minutes a day, on a 10-hour shift from 60 to 50. Employees would be required to take more physical exams, once a year for workers over 50, every other year for those over 40, every third year for those under 40 to reduce health care costs. And vacation would become a use-it-or-lose-it policy. And once these companies were profitable again a couple years later, did they pay back the employees' loyalty and restore the benefits of their workers? Absolutely fucking not. Of course they didn't. Why would they? What about their poor investors? Instead, these companies took their billions in profits and gave them to their investors via dividends and stock buybacks. For those of you who don't know what a buyback is, it's a company buying back their own shares, thereby reducing the shares in the market to artificially increase the stock price. This form of stock manipulation wasn't even legal until deregulation in the 1980s, because buybacks do absolutely nothing to improve the company. In fact, buybacks are effectively a negative spend against the future of the company. This money could go towards buying new companies, research, development, upgrading facilities, or simply paying back the employees who saved you from collapse. But rather than doing any of that, this money was transferred to shareholders. And how much did these companies spend on buybacks? Ford just announced a $500 million buyback. And Stellantis, owners of Dodge, Jeep, Fiat, and Citroen, they approved a 3 billion euro buyback. And GM, a company that claimed that it couldn't agree to terms with the UAW because it would threaten our ability to do what's right for the long-term benefit of the team? How much did they pour into buybacks? Since 2009, GM has spent 25 billion in stock buybacks, including 10 billion after the 2003 UAW agreement. Because they had plenty of money, just never enough to pay back their workers. And how did a conversation about games evolve into automakers and stock buybacks? I think you know the answer. Choosing stock buybacks over fairly paying workers is a pattern of behavior for big business. And games is big business. So it shouldn't be to anyone's surprise that gaming companies are doing the exact same thing to us. Here are the receipts. EA fired 800 employees in 2023, but over the last five years, they've averaged $271 million in stock buybacks every three months. Amazon, the owners of Twitch, fired 500 people this January. Two years ago, they had $10 billion in buybacks. Three months after they announced a $600 million buyback, Playtica fired 400. And the day after Microsoft announced it was worth $3 trillion, they fired 1,900 people and gave $8.4 billion to shareholders. By now, you're probably thinking about terms like awful, disgusting, and outrageous greed to describe these practices, and I'm not disagreeing, that's exactly what it is. But there's nothing illegal about what they're doing. They're taking care of themselves and making sure that they get theirs. Now we have to make sure that we get ours. How? Together. By standing together, we'll have much greater bargaining power than if we go at it alone. Together, we can collectively negotiate for all the things that we want. Better pay, no more working hours, and to make sure that the tech we're building helps us 
not replace us, and the movement towards unionization has already begun. CD Projekt Red employees started union efforts following the company's announcement that it was firing 9% of their employees by March 2024, their third round of layoffs in three months. QA workers at various studios owned by Activision Blizzard unionized over unstable job security, not enough pay, and long crunch hours where some worked 12 hour shifts for 28 days straight. But this road won't be easy or quick. Companies aren't about sharing those profits, so they'll do everything they can to prevent us from unionizing, including various stall tactics and misinformation. But let's just say we go on strike. They may even go as far as taking away our healthcare benefits, because that's how far some companies will go rather than fairly paying their workers. John Deere threatened to cut 10,000 of their employees' healthcare benefits during their strike in 2021. The company eventually didn't go through with it because once it became public, it became bad PR. But some companies straight up don't give a shit. Removing a worker's healthcare benefits is very effective because what are these workers and their families gonna do? Die? On September 1st, the hospital cut off our health insurance. I had cancer a couple of years ago and I have ongoing stuff related to that that I need to take care of. Uh, my wife was just recently diagnosed with some stuff that um, she's had a few procedures done in the past two weeks and needs ongoing care. She has a couple of appointments in the next few weeks and we're not sure how we're going to pay for those, if they're going to be paid for. And it's just devastating. And, you know, they want to talk about being a family. You don't do that to your family. GM did it to their workers in 2019. And teachers in Portland also had their health care taken away. Camila Arze teaches at McDaniel High. She has a newborn, a two-year-old, and a four-year-old who just had brain surgery. So this is really immediate for us. I'm feeling scared. Julia Kirkpatrick has a baby, too, and she takes insulin for type 1 diabetes. So for me, this district's decision to try and use our access to health care as, as a bargaining tactic is actually life or, or death. And if all else fails, companies have a nuclear option. Because depending on the profitability and how outsourceable you are, they may even choose to shut down an entire studio, a la Starbucks, just to make sure that none of you get any ideas about forming a union. Tonight, the workers' union believes it's about retaliation. This location will now become the fourth unionized store in Seattle to be shut down. And while Starbucks says it's about safety, some aren't buying it. The closure announcement comes one week after the Denny and Broadway location joined others across the country protesting in the Red Cup Rebellion. The potential consequences for forming a union don't sound very good. In fact, they sound scary as hell. But if we don't do this now, we'll be mistreated forever. But if we stand together, we can lay the foundations for a better life for not only ourselves, but generations to come. From the 8-hour day, 40-hour work week, increased worker safety, protections against child labor, and overtime pay. These were all fought and won because people stood together and demanded it. This is now our moment to stand up for ourselves. And I'm not saying that everybody should rush out immediately and join a union because it may not be right for you or your situation. There are no blanket solutions to this problem. But you could take the first steps towards solving this problem. Talk to your coworkers. See if they feel the same way you feel. Compare salaries, benefits, bonuses. Keeping everybody in the dark only helps your company, not you. Let's protect everybody against greed and make sure everybody is paid fairly. We're the most important part of gaming's $200 billion a year business. Let's act like it. But we have to do it together. Because alone, we'll get crushed. But together, we can get our fair share. Because without us, these companies have absolutely nothing.